All right, welcome, uh, welcome to this month's Mayday Monday podcast. Um, it is July 2021. We um, are uh, halfway, over halfway through the 2021 year. Um, the the hot temperatures are upon us, at least over here on the the East Coast, and um, it, we're summer is full swing. We're a couple days away here from while we video this. We're a couple days away from our our nation's birthday. July 4th, hopefully everybody will get out and celebrate that. Um, it seems like we are coming out, right? We're able to get outside now and 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 see people. So please uh, get together on the 4th of July and um, celebrate our nation's birthday. Um, since our last time that we got together for this, there have been a few line of duty deaths. Looking at the United States Fire Administration's website, uh, it looks like our, our numbers for this year so far, we have... 51 line of duty deaths. Uh, since the last time we were together, there was a firefighter who uh, died in a vehicle accident in New Bern, North Carolina. A uh, firefighter from San Francisco died of a heart attack. A firefighter in Titusville, Ohio, um, died of a pulmonary embolism. A St. Louis firefighter was uh, another stricken by, co by the COVID-19 virus. And uh, recently, a New Jersey firefighter died of a cardiac arrest after a live burn. So please uh, research these, these line of duty deaths. Um, they're, all, they're all very important. We need to know exactly how all of our members are succumbing to injuries and what we can do to hopefully not have that happen. Uh, with me today, we have uh, Jay Betancourt. Jay is from the Asheville, North Carolina Fire Department. Um, again, um, just like previous Mayday Monday podcast, we have a mutual friend, uh, old retired guy from Charlotte, North Carolina, got us together. Uh, we made connection over the phone, and and now we are we are doing it over a Zoom call. So uh, thanks for being here, uh, Jay. I, I can't wait to hear your story, and uh, we'll talk about uh, Jeff Bowen. Jay, will you uh, just give a quick introduction and bio on who you are? Yeah, Tony, thanks for having me. I really appreciate coming on your show. It's, um, it's a big deal. So yeah, my name is Jay Betancourt. I'm with the Asheville Fire Department. I've been with Asheville for 12 years, almost all that time assigned to Rescue Company 3, where I currently hold the rank of engineer, been an engineer for about seven years. Um, <clears throat> I met our mutual friend, Captain Harden, when I got invited to come take, uh, take the breeding equipment school curriculum, and then came back as an instructor in 2012. And I've been doing that ever since. I'm pretty active in firefighter survival and um, RIT training in my department and other places around the country. Awesome, yeah, Harden. I met Harden in um, at FDTN out in um, oh yeah Indianapolis. Nice. I think he and I we took the first the first Mayday firefighter survival Mayday writ train the trainer that uh, the guys out there at FDTN did. Right. And um, yeah, met Scott. And every once in a while, we'll you know, run into each other. Um, he did hook me up. I was in Charlotte one time for a conference, and I didn't have a car. They they actually came and picked me up. The fire truck came, picked me up, and took me to the uh, to the, awesome. to the conference and stuff. So um, he's, he operates in some unusual areas and unusual ways to get yeah. some things done. He's but pretty good effective, guy. though. He's a really effective guy. Yeah, FDTN is great. You must have been there when it was pretty small. I guess it was was it just that one original container that was there yeah, yeah that's yeah it's like a city now it's amazing that yeah. place is, i mean it's like the it's like the wild west of live fire train it's just yeah that's amazing you've been there yeah yeah i've gotten to go help out with uh, some of the fire fire boot camp schools you know i i help me and trey young who's i guess he's been on this show he, we get to help out with the firefighter survival can i think trey's a full-time instructor out there now it's it's pretty amazing what what mccormick has built yeah, it really is. It really is. And I, yeah, humble beginnings. Right. And uh, um, yeah. like everything that we see in the fire service, that's so successful mm -hmm. um, ground, right. up, you know, um, firefighter made and no, you know, I, he's been able to separate from the big industries and stuff. Now right. it's really, yeah. really yeah. good. Yeah, it's pretty. I can't imagine. I mean, I've, I've been around the world, but I can't imagine there's a more in-depth live fire training school in the world. I mean, he's got such a such a mega town that basically every every building can be lit on fire with this selection of fire trucks and all the good instructors he brings out there. It's, it's a pretty amazing place. And 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 successfully, right? I mean, yeah. we're not. Yeah. We know that if if it if it has if it had any injuries, it had been shut down years ago. Right. So they're yeah. doing they're doing great live fire and, and mm -hmm. uh, no yeah. one's getting hurt and yeah. It's right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. McCormick. It's funny the stuff that um, we've brought hit different drills to him for firefighter survival and he is so meticulous with what he allows and doesn't allow to make sure firefighters are safe. 
that he, he shoots down a lot of our stuff. It's like, no, because I can't guarantee or, you know, all but guarantee people are going to make it out safely and still get trained. That's good to know, right? That, yeah. I mean, you think that, yeah. um, like you say, the Wild West, but it's actually not, right? It's very, yeah. very meticulous. Yeah, I, I shouldn't say it. it is very, especially with with McCormick. It's it's meticulous. Everything is thought of down to the down to the penny, down to every you know, every single pallet's accounted for in these fires. He knows how much BTUs he's going to get out, how much smoke he's going to produce. Yeah, Pretty good easy. stuff. So let's get started with this. I'm going to share the yeah. screen and um, go over a couple of things here. Let me find my stuff. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hey. All right. So this is uh, this month's, this is this month's, um, oh crap, hold on, too much going on. This is this month's May Day Monday post. Um, and um, this is last month's here. Last month we talked to, uh, it was a great podcast. If you haven't seen it, go back and look at it. If you um, want some, some knowledge nuggets, on how to survive the fire service. Last month, uh, you got some really good stuff from a couple of really experienced uh, firefighters, uh, one retired New York City guy, and then the captain of Rescue Two, um, remembering their friend, Vinny Fowler, and the sacrifice he made in that fire. So go back, please go back. If you did look at it, go back and look at it again, because I bet you will pick up something that you didn't, you didn't pick up last time. So let's talk about Asheville. Asheville, North Carolina. Let me uh, stop this real quick. Asheville, where, where, where is it in North Carolina? I'm familiar with uh, my my parents retired to uh, New Bern. Okay, we were out there. So well, obviously, that's a whole different place than than yeah, where Asheville is on the other side of the state. It's in western North Carolina, right at the you know right in the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Appalachians. Um, Asheville is kind of the biggest river valley in the Appalachian Mountains as they run through North Carolina. So that's why the city was built there. But it's, you know, it's a couple thousand feet higher than the rest of the state. It's, um, it's almost like an island, you know, compared to the rest of the state. I, I, do a, <clears throat> I do a line of duty death remembrance bike ride around North and South Carolina every year. And when we, every time we roll back into North Carolina, I realize how different, how unique it is to the rest of the state. But, you know, it's a beautiful mountain town. Um, there it is before you. It's about it's about ninety thousand residents, but because of um, the high influx of tourism and because it's a county seat and there's a lot of jobs, we fill to about two hundred fifty thousand people during the day. You know, so it's it's definitely a, a highway town as far as people coming in and out. Um, what is the? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I want to go there. Because, I, mean, I would like to be a tourist because I hear about the good craft beer. Yeah. Um, but what's the other draw to Asheville? The mountains, the mountains, the rivers, there's hundreds of waterfalls within an hour drive of Asheville. You know, people like to float the river and go for hikes and go check out waterfalls and just be in the mountains and then come down from the day adventure to drink a bunch of good beer at our many breweries or go to all these, like every, in this picture you have here, every one of these hotels has a rooftop bar that enjoys a great view. So you can imagine how nice the sunsets would be from up there, especially after you've been out mountain biking or hiking or rafting or, you know, kind of outdoorsy activities. So um, the rest, I, I'm, again, I'm familiar with uh, the East Coast, right, which is uh -huh. beach town, really nice beaches and stuff out there. Right. Um, and you, you could say Asheville is just like a, a mountain oasis that even right. Charlotte's not. And that, right. uh, that whole track that goes down, you know, from, from Roanoke down to Charlotte is kind of, I mean, it's, there's some mountains, but not like Asheville. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can follow that picture you have of the Blue Ridge Parkway. That's, you know, it's the line of the, of the Blue Ridge and Asheville's right in it. You know, the, the Blue Ridge Parkway, Parkway runs about a mile from my house, you know, and that's the reason that so many people come here. That's the reason why breweries are building here. It's, it's not just the, with the breweries, it's not just the mountains, but the water that comes out of the mountains. You know, they like the high quality water they can get to make their beer is what I've found out over the years. So, but pretty much it's a, it's, I, I get it. It's the, 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 the city center there is get gets a big influx mm -hmm. um, but you have a lot of uh, bedroom and and neighborhoods outside of that mm -hmm. downtown yeah. core yep yeah it's a you know it's a small city you know we've lost a lot of our it was a it was a mill town and it was the place where people would bring livestock in we've lost our big livestock auction we've lost all of our mills over the years and now it's all those buildings have been transformed to some sort of restaurant or bar the 
the big livestock auction got bulldozed and turned into a, another major brewery. Um, and then all the, you know, the bedroom communities around Asheville, really it's hard to live in Asheville. It's hard to work in Asheville and afford to live in Asheville, mm-hmm. you know? So a lot of the people that work in Asheville, most firefighters won't work in the city or won't live in the city and will drive in, but it's slowly but surely getting turned over from an old kind of mill town county seat into a kind of a tourist Mecca, a lot of, a lot of rentals and uh, hotels, that sort of thing. Big um, millennials there. I guess. I mean, am I a millennial? <laughs> Maybe, but yeah, I guess there's a lot of millennials, a lot of hipsters, a lot of, uh, a lot of fashion victims. You fashion know, victims, we have, uh, uh, I think I often refer to myself as a Narcan expert. That's a big part of my job. And it's a, it's a big part of uh, certain pockets of Asheville. You know, we've, we've got our yeah. share of, um, of housing projects and whatnot as well, but it's, yeah. um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, Let's see. No, I guess no place is stranger to Narcan anymore. No place is a stranger to Narcan. No. Yeah. Well, all right. So let's uh, talk about the fire department. How big okay. is the Asheville fire department? Oh man, look at all these good looking pictures you have, Mister. So this is a, on the left. That's brother and sister Sarka. They went through rookie school together. Sister is by far the tougher of the two Sarkas. <laughs> she's married to another firefighter, so she's Mrs. Willis now. But Asheville fire Asheville has about two hundred and eighty uniform personnel. We have. 12 stations, 16 companies, um, one rescue company that I'm assigned to. Um, and we have, we're about 50 square miles of a city, which we don't, you wouldn't necessarily need that many fire companies or fire stations if our city was a square or if it was mm-hmm. flat. But because we have so many ridges that, that run through the city and a big river, we have to we have to have more companies that go up these veins. As you look at it, if you look at a map of our fire districts, it looks like a spider that kind of comes out from the center of the of the city up all these different valleys from annexation over the years. Um, we ran, I think about 22,000 calls last year. Um, my company ran about 2,800, 3,000 of those calls. Good, so um, you said 12 engines? No, 12 stations, eight oh, engines, eight three, engines. three quints, two aerials. Um, two, you know, two big aerial trucks. We just got our first tiller in a gener- in several generations. It's our first uh, truck that doesn't have a pump or fire hose on it, which is kind of exciting. Those guys really get to specialize. Um, no ambulances? No ambulance. We don't run ambulance service. We're, um, yeah, no transport here, which is, which is kind of nice. What kind of pipe dream place is this? Huh? <laughs> the, t- the type that pays way less than fire stations with ambulance have. That's what guys, <laughs> you get what you pay I for, see. you know. No, I definitely, I've met, I've met a few men. I can't remember where, uh, I guess they came up for some training that I was working on. Um, and maybe they came to Knoxville, Tennessee. Also we did, uh, okay. ISFSI had a conference out there a few years ago. And I remember meeting some, um, Asheville guys. I also met a couple motorcycle guys in, um, down in South Carolina last year, um, for a ride, they rode down to see uh, some guys at a at a house that I, I went out to see too. Cool. So they're definitely uh, representing well and getting getting mm-hmm. out in the in that that region area with a good representation for Asheville. Yeah, we've got a lot of good guys. We have a good department. Our training cadre and our training division is really good, and we um, we run people through a pretty effective rookie school. You know, I've gone around and <clears throat> worked with a few different rookie schools over the years doing firefighter survival stuff. And I think our, our, our city's um, training kind of weighs up with some of the bigger departments in the area, which I'm really proud of. And, I, and it attracts pretty eight up firefighters. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Speaking of eight up firefighters, let's talk about uh, Captain Bowen. Uh, Captain mm-hmm. Bowen is, uh, is the subject of this month's Mayday Monday. And uh, with Jay, uh, the incident they were involved with, uh, Jeff um, hailed from California. How did he get out to North Carolina? Do you know? Oh yeah, I certainly do. Captain Bowen. Um, he he was a Del Rio hotshot out of the, out of Southern California for about seven years, and they laid him off every year, as I think is still the practice with hotshots. And uh, he wanted a full time job. He looked at different jobs in um, California. Nothing was really panning out. You know, um, he came to. Where was it? Where did he go? He came to McDowell County, which is a really rural county um, east of Asheville, to chase a girl one winter. Like he came, he she was a hot shot as well. He came back to North Carolina with her just to be with her throughout the winter. Saw that Asheville was higher, and they they scooped him up immediately. They saw that experience and saw what a good guy he was, and they hired him on. 
and he stayed. The girlfriend did not last very long. And he had some, he has some great train wreck stories about that, but um, he stayed in Nashville. And uh, soon after that, he met his lovely wife, Stacy Bowen. And her, she's a lo- was she a local girl? Yeah, Stacy is a local. She's one of the few locals. She was born and raised in Alexander, which is a kind of a small, like, I guess you call it a village, not really a town, just a small area of uh, Alexandria where Captain Bowen's living. She was born and raised there. That's where her family came from. She's a true local, which is so, hard to find uh, around here. Jeff and Stacy uh, ended up, uh, they had three kids, Robin, Sarah, and Charlie Ray. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, those are all three of their kids. That, those were kids that Stacy had from a previous marriage, but uh, Captain Bowen adopted all three of them, and they um, um, they took they took Jeff on as their dad, and um, it's they they really had a good thing going there. His their family life, and their Captain Bowen's marriage to Stacy was pretty inspiring. There's one thing I really appreciate about him as a company officer is he he um, he had his his stuff together at home and at work. Yeah, that's tough, right? With that, they get mm-hmm. that work life separation and. Uh, yeah putting that first um i was trying to buy a boat here so that i can nice. uh i can write i can i can put that uh when we when we we're not working we can we, we have a lake house so we can get out there and float around and um i also had a motorcycle i felt that was really selfish so <laughs> now, like, now if i get a, a boat a pontoon hopefully then um, you can share you know, with the rest have, of the family right i can take everybody with me right nice yeah, yeah. exactly Exactly. So at the time of Jeff's uh, death, he had 13 years in the fire department. He had 13 years in Asheville when he died. He had actually just bought a motorcycle also. Mm-hmm. Like that summer, he bought his, I, I think it was his first motorcycle since he'd been in Asheville. He was pretty excited about it. Which is Motorcycles are tough. They just, uh, we just lost a firefighter in, in Baltimore City. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, she, she passed away on a um, off-duty motorcycle accident. So if you are a rider, you know, again, um, this is the time where we have to be heightened awareness. And if you're a car right. rider, if you're a car rider, please look out for motorcycles. So anyways, it seems like uh, he was pretty active in the fire department, though, huh? He was active. He was a go to guy. He um, the last big thing he took on before he passed away was we didn't have a really organized way of training our company officers when he came on and he put together a company officer academy. Nice. And he, pre- he presented to the fire chiefs and they, um, they, they accepted it, ran with it. They made some tweaks here and there, which, you know, Captain Bone was happy with some of them and unhappy with others. You know how it is when you create a program and gets handed off. But that's what we use today. I graduated from that company officer academy uh, last year in order to take, take my officer's test. And it's kind of neat that his, his legacy is, is living on in that way. He also, we had a couple, we had a near miss with a uh, dive mission when he was, when he was the company officer and he, he put a lot of effort into kind of resurrecting our dive program, which we have a pretty solid dive program now. And that was, that was he did the company officer program. Then he worked on dive that summer. And, and our dive program is way better than it was before Captain Bowen got his hands on it. And those are just two examples of things. He would, he would see holes. And I think the, the, the unique thing about Captain Bowen with stuff like that is there's a lot of guys that have good ideas and there's a lot of guys that are good at organizing, but he had it all. He could, ha- he could see a problem, have a good idea about how to fix it come up with a solution and follow it all the way to completion. You know, he was that kind of soup to nuts leader that is pretty rare. I think in any business, not just the fire service, he wasn't just an ideas man or just a worker, but he, he could do it all. That that's, that's good. That's hopefully I'm sure uh, Asheville fire department misses, oh, yeah. uh, misses his guidance, but um, somebody else uh, hopefully stepped up and, and mm-hmm. is going to lead the charge and, and carry on um, so that, um, no, you know, you don't, you know, you don't lack what you need. Right. Yeah, and we do. We have a lot. We have a lot of good guys, and he was certainly a standout. Good, good. So at this time, when he was assigned to the rescue company with you, well, I was assigned with him. <laughs> gotcha. I got yep. you. Yep. I got you. So you uh, were recently assigned there at the time. This time, or yeah. So I got hired um, June, July twenty seventh, two thousand nine. And when I got hired, Asheville had a system where a rookie would float around your sh- whole shift for maybe two years where you didn't really get an assignment. And every morning you'd call into the office and the chief would say, okay, we need you at engine nine or we need you on ladder one or we need you wherever, you know, and you just kind of float around until there's an opening or until you kind of hit it off with a captain who would go to bat for you. And then you'd get a spot. Well, I, um, I hit it off with captain Bowen pretty early. And I have a background in mountain guiding and, and uh, rope access stuff. And so I, I met him and we, we got along pretty well. And 
he had a spot in his truck randomly because one of his guys was um had gotten married and was moving to Georgia. And so he he picked me for his truck. He had me assigned to him. And so I got to I got to be under him pretty early. And um so when the fire happened, July 28th, 2011 was, you know, it was a day after my second anniversary with the with the fire department. So I was yeah, I was I was still very much a rookie, but was just starting to kind of learn my way around. You know, I'd, yeah. I'd been there long enough to have an understanding of what was going on, but it was still just a, you know, total greenhorn. So that, that day, the day of the incident, I, I, what I'm reading, I seemed like you were detailed somewhere else to be a driver. Yeah, no. So, um, so again, we, uh, so we ran minimum staffing of four people on the rescue company and on most of our companies at that time, we saw a few holes, but even with minimum staffing of four, we had this policy where you could go train somewhere else in the city. And the idea was that if there was a big call that came in, you could just leave the training and go to the call, right? So that's what I was doing. I was away doing some driver training because at, at the two-year mark, you, I, you were eligible to promote to senior firefighter and that's a big pay raise and a bunch of other stuff. But part of that is having a bunch of driver's hours in, you know? And so I was getting some of those hours, you know, driving with, a, with another engineer. But... Um, yeah, the call came in. It was so funny. Like the call, it was right around 12. I pulled the truck back into, this, into station 10 and the officer there is like, hey, Jay, your company just went to a fire at 445 Biltmore Avenue. And the first thing I thought was that must be the wrong address because there's no houses at 445 Biltmore. And that's the fire we run in Asheville. You know, we, we've done a lot of, we do a lot of house fires. We do a lot yeah, of uh, like yeah. small apartment fires. And I just, it, it didn't click in my brain that we could be having a, you know, a high rise fire in our central business district in the hospital area, you know, cause that's just not a, such an uncommon occurrence for us. So that, that, uh, the run though came out as an automatic fire alarm. It came out as a pole station fire alarm and that, um, the, um, the fire alarm system had been put in trouble mode because they had been getting so many alarms the month previous that the fire marshal just had to put the fire, um, put the fire alarm system offline and had him do a fire watch. So security oh, guards were wash, walking the um, walking the fire floor, walking the building every 30 minutes. And at around 12 o'clock, this security guard got to the fifth floor. He smelled smoke, heard the crackling of fire, maybe felt a little heat. And then he, he pulled the alarm and started evacuating the building. So did it generate um, a fire response or the alarm response? It generated, an alarm, it, it generated a high risk alarm response. So that got, which is a pretty big response, you know, so that got... Um, two engines, a ladder, and uh, a squad, which is a, basically another engine that has some more technical capabilities. So, you know, so, so in essence, three engines and a truck company came to that fire alarm, which is pretty strong. Does it you get know, a chief too? And it does not, it, did, it does now, it did not then. So no chief, the first due engine officer, he pulls in, sees fire blowing out of the fifth floor windows. It's already ventilated, it's already self-ventilated, you know? And so he, he declares it a worker, and he calls for a second alarm. There was some, there was some confusion with the communication. So he ends up getting a, a single alarm response. So he, they basically fill the box for a single right. alarm fire, which gets two chiefs, a fire marshal, excuse me, the rescue company, and then one more engine. To fill the box. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now we've got um, four engines, if you will, because the squad. Yeah. The squad's gonna, an engine. Gonna... The squad's, the, 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 yeah. The squad's an engine. They were going to be an engine. So you got yep. four engines, two trucks, a rescue squad, two Four battalions. engines, one truck, one truck. Oh, one truck. Okay. Four engines, one truck, a rescue, and uh, two chiefs. Was was that one of those engines as a quint probably, right? Um, but it not, would operate, not on that response. Not, it could be. It certainly could be, but not at that address. At I that address, it. it was the extra engine was engine six, which is a true engine. You know. So um, – when we go back, so you left uh, the other firehouse mm -hmm. and were driving over mm -hmm. and decided to go to the run to the to the yeah. to the address. Yeah, I was yeah I was driving. I was I drove past my station. And I was you know I was because I was they were rookie. down and with, they were they were operating without you. Right? Yeah, they were operating without me, and that was kind of the, and they so, were operating without you. Yeah, so they had done their first wave, like they they got there. You know, engine two got there, engine one, squad one, ladder one got there, and they did kind of their first wave of stuff, um, force indoors, stretch and high rise kits. Well, engine one went to the roof and secured the cock loft. Engine four did a, like a pre plan on the fourth floor, or engine two did a pre plan on the fourth floor, and then uh, rescue got there and did a pri started doing primary search for life and fire, and I got there right as they were coming out. 
is when I, I got to command with gear and a radio and an ax from, from my truck from rescue three, right. As rescue three was coming out of their first run. Like, I, like coming out, out to get a new bottle. Yeah. It's a new, a new oh, bottle. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to clear one thing out. I, I, the uh, the building was six stories, but it was the fifth floor. Yeah, like because the first it was, floor um, is nothing. The first floor is a daylighted basement. I got you. And so, like, if in the it was all we always talked about the fifth floor because you walked into the second floor um, from the parking lot just because the way the you know the just, we live in the yeah. hills you know, yeah. and if you went like to go to the elevators, it would say the fifth floor is the top in the elevator, and so it just got referred to as the fifth floor. I got you. You know, I got you. It was just reading some things. It says a six-story building with the fires on the right. fifth floor. It's actually and we have those seven as well. Seven-story right? building because there's the there's the six floors plus the seventh floors on top was like a big mechanical room. You know, but it's okay. Um, but yeah, okay. So five so, floors on a daylight basement in in practice. You know, so a disgruntled employee set a fire. I don't know that. I don't know. There's um there's a lot of speculation about this unsolved murder. Wow. At this point. And so there's nothing I know about the investigation or who might have done it or how. Right. But it was a set fire. It was an arson fire. Yes. So an arson fire on the sixth on the fifth floor mm -hmm. in, in what a file room? Several rooms, mainly room that uh, was one office, like the, like the doctors kind of not the office where you'd see patients, but where the doctor might do their work, you know, like a desk and whatnot. And then several rooms that were full of uh, medical files, like cardboard boxes full of paper files. So a pretty good fire load. Pretty good fire load, especially when you cover it with kerosene. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So uh, engine two was the first arriving engine. Engine two's first arriving engine. They, um, they do a pre-plan on the fourth floor, figure out that they can, they think they can make the stretch with 150 feet of two and a half, which is our high rise load in Nashville. And, but they don't think they can do it if they hook up to the floor below. So they go to the floor, they go to the fire floor, hook up, stretch, and they, um, they come up short because they, uh, the, um, we talked about this, the, the fourth floor, the stairwell exited to the west of the building and the fifth floor exited to the north of the building. So when they came out of the out onto the fifth floor in high, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Just that's what happened. So they they come out and they end up making this this right turn away from the fire and end up doing this kind of curly Q thing that, that you see. That was because here. of this 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 door right no, here. No, it was because. Person? Can you see my cursor? Can everybody see my cursor? No. So the door, like you see where the hose comes out. Yeah. If if. The, the door that they thought it was going to come out this way. Do you see that? No, I can't see yours. You see so, mine? Yeah, I see yours. So you're going, you're following those. So if you go left on left on the screen, that's where the door on the fourth floor came out. And that is where that door originally was before there was an illegal modification. So if they had come out going to the left, like to the west, you know, yeah, uh -huh. and then turned right, they'd have gone straight to where that door is that you got your cursor on and they could have easily found their way to the fire. So yeah. when they come out in the smoke and end up do the right hand turn, which they had planned to, they figure it out right about there, like right where your cursor is. Uh -huh. And then they, they kind of they have to punt. You know? So you say that, that they were planning on coming this way uh -huh. and making a right, right, which would have taken them that way. Yes. But instead they went this way and made a right. Right. And then it took yep. them this way. I right. see. And, they, so and I, there was still fire. Like where you see that alcove where it says alcove there, there was fire down those down those rooms on the left of the fire hallway. All those rooms had fire in them. So they made, you know, they made the stretch to fire and they were popping ceiling tiles and there was fire in that plenum space there. So they weren't to the deepest part of the seat of the fire, but all the all those rooms down that hallway there had fuel and kerosene and were burning. So, so they were putting water on fire, just not the seat of the fire yet. Well, that's they they stretched to it. We had a lot of uh, standpipe issues there. Yeah. So they were able to charge the ho the, when they charged the standpipe, they were able to charge the hose line when they when they opened the bale to spray water. It sprayed for a second, and then the hose pipe went flat. Hmm. And um, the best we can we've we've been able the only way we've been able to. Um, well, you know, I can't say anything more about that because it's still, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't talk about that. But so we figured out a way to make that happen. 
the the uh, coming of this the starting and stopping of water yes we figured out a way to sim to make that repeat but i it's it's funny man i've never come to this case before i've never been recorded talking about this but i can't talk about it in a recording because the investigation and that's what the the um the uh, arson investigators told me this is one of the things that they like to not have as public knowledge because they don't want they want to be able to use against you. the person they catch i got so you. anyway well, we have, the we haven't had that were, many we haven't had that many uh, views of this, so you should be okay. But we'll no, see. man, this is going to go worldwide, Tony. If you're, <laughs> when you get your Radio uh, uh, Academy Award, I don't want people going back and listening to this thing. The arsonists will figure out the secrets. But anyway, the, the upshot is the standpipe never produced enough water to be an effective fire stream. So the guys at the ground level were pumping the standpipe? Yes. And they were giving it what it should have got. Giving it what it should have gotten. Uh, and it, and and not when I and it was a a go to engineer like I I trust all our engineers in the fire department but this guy was like kind of next level. Um, yeah, we all have that guy, right? I get. You know, he was he was tight. Like if he the guy the engineer on engine one that day he was tight. He got his numbers right. He was meticulous about his truck. He did it right. It was not him. Okay, so um, this, I'm not sure what floor the level this is, but we're that's, seeing- That's right five, here. that's that's the fire floor. Um, so this this is this was supposed to come out straight. Right. But because of this turn, which you say was Ill, was was not permitted. Unpermitted, it was unpermitted. Gotcha. So I don't know how illegal that is, but- I got you. So that took them this way and kind of away from messing up their game plan. Yeah, yeah, they've got a punt now. And um, you guys had the, had the hose line for a, a, a minute? So, yeah, so, so I, I get, I, I, I drive myself to the call. I get all my gear. I go to command, which is on the, on the West side of the building. And I was like, Hey, where's, where's rescue three, you know, as a safety officer at the time, he's like, just hang out with me. They're coming out. They're on their way out. Just wait. And so I see them come out. Um, and as I said, we were kind of behind the ball with staffing because there's some miscommunication about, um, about the alarms. So when, when Captain Bowen comes out with Rescue 3, there's no one out there to take his place. Like there's no other companies on scene. Everyone was in the building. And the battalion chief's like, I need a company up there right now to handle this. Because, you know, we're pretty accustomed to putting water on the fire quickly. You know, like it was really weird that we didn't have any water on this fire after all these firefighters have gone up and come down. And so Captain Bowen's like, we're ready to go back in. We just need to swap bottles. I ran over, swapped, hot swapped with Captain Bowen. Um, the driver, the firefighter from Engine 1, what ended up going to rehab. And then, so the, the captain who was an acting captain, who's a firefighter, he joined rescue company three to go back in for a second wave. So now we're a team of five, you know, it was a three, the first wave with captain boat. Now it's a team of five and we start heading up immediately. Um, uh, the, 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 the stairwell was charged with smoke all the way down. Like on the first floor. On the first floor, it was so, so small. Like as soon as you got in, you had to start. As soon as I get in, I model. clicked, and yeah. yeah, and I was, and like, I, as soon as I walked in, I was, I was like, my God, I, we're not going to be very effective because we're going to have to breathe air for five flights of stairs. So I clicked in, and Captain Bowen, you know, he was a hot shot. I was kind of worried that he was going to not click in because he's such a, you know, those those smoke eaters, those high, wildland guys, they eat a lot of smoke, and he clicked in like he got on his air immediately, also, which I was really glad to see. But but he had uh, he, this is his second run. He'd already second been run. up there for a, yep. for a minute. Come back mm -hmm. down, got a new bottle. Mm -hmm. They're in. You're 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 uh, you're you're bottled up. You're masked up in the stairwell on the on the would be the second floor. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. So the it's hard to say, man. But like the the first of five floors, so okay. the second floor of the building, you know. But so um, you made it, you made it uh, up to the fire floor, or did you mm -hmm. go to the fourth first to check no, out? No, we went up to the fire floor and um, it was super smoky, but not very angry smoke. Like it was real thick gray laminar smoke, you know, and since, and I imagine this is just me imagining, but that's the reason Captain Bowen moved so fast at that point was because he'd already been there. So he, we popped mm -hmm. out into the smoke and we're moving fast on our feet. And it's so thick that I've got to like put my hand on the guy in front of me. And it's like, wait for me. Don't, don't lose me. You know? And like, I was, I was, they were pulling away from me. And so I would just put my hand on the guy in front of me. I can touch him, but not see his, like not see him, you know? Wow. And so, you know, we, we rounded the, um, we followed that, the, uh, the hose. I didn't realize we were following a hose at the time. I just knew we were going and making a bunch of quick turns, you know, I'm getting kind of disoriented as the, um, 
as we're making these turns. Yeah, yeah. Like, so we're t- we turn right out of that stairwell. Guys, you can't see that. And we're just kind of going around. I know you can't see that, but yeah, right there. And, um, and so I get pretty disoriented as we're doing this. And I was like, oh my God, I got to keep up with these guys. Because Captain Bowen created a really good team. I just wanted to keep up with them. And we ended up right there where it says uh, reception area. Where, and that's where the nozzle was. Um, uh, yeah, so then Captain Bowen like sits us all down and he starts calling for water. And he's, you know, he's like, rescue threes on, you know, we're on the fire floor. We've got the standpipe or we've got, the, we've got the high rise uh, kit hooked up to the standpipe. We need water. We're at the seat of the fire or we're close to the seat of the fire, you know, cause we were, he'd been up here before to that same area and he was finding fire. And he, he thought right there was kind of the seat of the fire. He didn't realize right. that we had, there was, it was all along that North stairwell or all along that, uh, that Western stairwell. Anyway. Um, and this is where, man, Captain Bohm was a super, um, he was a good firefighter. He was a great fire captain. He took really good care of us and he was really into fighting fire. Um, so he calls down to command. He's like, we got the seat of the fire. We're on the nozzle. We just need water to the standpipe. And command's reply is, uh, um, we can't get water to the standpipe. Go ahead and come out of the building. And you know, no one wants to hear that, right? I mean, like I'm, I'm this rookie firefighter that's just so excited to go to the show. You know, we're at the big fire that we've read about in fire engineering. It's like, oh my God, this is finally our turn. You know, because you said, you know, I just want to go to big fires. Um, anyway, so Captain Bowen kind of dodges the call. You know, he's like, oh, rescue, this is rescue three. We're going to kind of search. Or I forget what he says, but basically he's just like avoiding leaving mm. the building, you know, because we're, mm. we're trying to get some action. And I was sitting right next to him. You know, and I was like cheering him on, you know, it's like, heck yeah, Cap, let's keep, keep us in here. And then like, we, we didn't do anything. We just kind of sat there and like a couple minutes later, he gets on the radio again. He's like, this is rescue three from to command. I, I need water to the standpipe. We're at the seat of the fire. And again, come, like the chief outside's like, you don't, we can't get water. The standpipe's not working. Come out of the building. Mm-hmm. And, um, and no one really picked up on this. Like, like for Captain Bowen to die in this fire, he was not at his best. Like there was something going on with him that we'll, I guess we'll never understand at this point. But these are like, that's, those are some of the clues that we didn't pick up on at the mm-hmm. time that he's, because he was such a dependable and go-to fire captain that it was kind of beyond the pale to think, oh, there's something wrong with Jeff. Like no one would, no one would have assumed that Captain Bowen was, was anything but, but A1. Anyway, mm-hmm. so again, they tell him to come out of the building again. He's kind of dodged the call. The third time he says, um, he does the same thing again. This is of course about five minutes. The third time he says like, send, send water to the standpipe. We got the fire. The chief's like, come out of the building. Uh, anyway, engine six has, they've commandeered uh, ladder one. They're stretching off the aerial. They're putting water on the fire. So Captain Bowen hears that. And he's, he's like, all right, we're going to go help six. So we stand up and we move up that hallway um, kind of on the left side of that map that that goes um to the yeah, north side of the back. building i'll go back here yeah yeah that whole that hallway right there yep so we move up that hallway and if you, right where it says alcove there on the right that's about where i i was t- i was at the end of the five person line i end up right about there and i mean we're just like standing in this line and um i say to the guys like i'm gonna go search this room like watch my back and one of the guy, one of the firefighters from Rescue Three, he acknowledges that. And I go search all those rooms in the alcove, and they were all clear. But I, you know, I just kind of wanted to do something fireman like, you know, because we just kind of been sitting around this whole time. And while I'm doing that, the guys say uh, those those two firefighters that were in the back with me, they're like, "Hey, we're gonna take the glass and this room next door here, which is the one um, to the left and up of the alcove." that no the one that one that one right there yeah with the arrow kind of cutting through it right to the corner that's the windows that they that they want to take and i was like all right sounds good and so they radio down to command like hey tell the guys on the truck that we're going to take the glass take glass on the north side of the building watch out for falling glass and you might already have picked out what's wrong with this picture is we're not on the north side of the building we're on the west side of the building you, you know and so we go in that room we take glass there's three big pan uh commercial windows or big panes which is pretty fun. And I stick my head out the window and I realize that we're, that we're on the West side of the building, not on the North side of the building, you know? Mm. And that's what it kind of dawns on me is like, it's not just me that was feeling kind of disoriented. I was like, at least these two other guys are kind of lost too, mm. you know? Mm. And uh, so this room, anyway, that room was full of burning cardboard boxes full of paper files. Right. 
and um, <clears throat> it, the fire wasn't really going off. But when we broke the glass, that's when it finally got what it needed, right? And we didn't notice at the time, but that room there was, it was just kind of like this really laid back fire because it didn't have enough oxygen. And <clears throat> we unwisely broke the glass, but that didn't really dawn on us until a little bit later because right then one of our firefighters started banging. The more senior guy, he starts banging. He goes to Captain Bowen and he's like, hey, Cap, I got um, to get out of here. I'm running low on air. And so Captain Bowen agrees. And he, uh, he stands us up and turns us around and we kind of go back the same way we had just come in, past the alcove, where the no past where the nozzle is, where it says reception area, follow the hose line back around and make that same loop-de-loop -loop around the stairwell to the elevators, right. Um, meanwhile, everybody, what we're making that trip, everybody starts banging, or at least four of the five of us start banging. I don't think the driver was banging at that point. Banging means you're banging, low on, banging you're, with low on air, like the vibe alerts going off on the Scott air pack. Now in Asheville, now this is unacceptable. We don't use our emergency air for anything but emergencies. But back in the day, like when this fire happened, that was very common. You know, you can listen to the radio trap for this fire and it's all over the place. People, people in this, you know, in this building, their vibe alerts going off, they're getting low on air. They're still taking assignments and doing stuff and asking for reassignment. And it doesn't set off one red flag for anybody right. on scene right now. I mean, obviously, you know, you're just, we're just rolling. We're guaranteeing that we were going to kill somebody with that strategy because right. sometimes somebody was going to get lost or break a leg or fall in a hole and they wouldn't have the air to deal with it, which is basically what happens here. Anyway, so Captain Bowen walks us around to, um, to where the North stairwell's door is. And there's that big area above that that says fireplace room. When we get there, there's a firefighter who's stretching out a, a, a high rise kit, right? He's got his 150 foot of two and a half and he's kind of flaking it out. And I kind of chuckle to myself because we, the standpipe's not working, right? And this guy's flaking out another, another hose. And then there's engine, engine one and uh, squad one had brought their high rise kits up and they were kind of flaked out in the North stairwell out onto the fire floor a little bit. And then engine two's high rise kit was flaked out. It was actually stretched, right? But it, like, you know, so now we've got 300 feet of dry hose stretched all over this fire floor, but there's no mm -hmm. water. Like we cannot use this hose at all, but we've just got all this hose here. And, and to me, I was just, I just laughed. That was all. I, the only thing that occurred to me, I was like, this is funny. Um, not realizing that that hose could have been a way out for somebody, you know, and now it's just kind of useless. Anyway, Captain Bowen's talking to this officer, who's the officer of that firefighter and kind of giving him a good rundown of what we, what's going on up there. And then our driver is, is getting a little concerned because the firefighter that he would normally be assigned to, we break into teams of two a lot. You know, we go a split function. Uh -huh. so the driver would go with the senior guy. Um, so the driver's like, Hey Cap, we got to go. We got to go. If my guy's getting low on air, he feels pretty responsible for this guy. And so finally Captain Bowen stands up and he's like, look, man, you go with him. You, you go downstairs. I'll be right behind you. I got Jay with me. We'll be right out. Just go. And so the, the driver and this firefighter, they, uh, they, that seems fair, you know, it makes sense. And so they we're all right there at the stairs. They just make the stairs and they start working their way down. Um, and I'm watching all this go down and then I see Captain Bowen start walking towards the stairs and he, he blows right by the stairs uh, heading west and then takes that left down this hallway that we haven't been down yet. Yeah, so that right there. Yep, so he takes that left, not as far as you're going, but he takes a left there and, um, and this is when I realized something bad is happening. Like up to this point, I just kind of felt like, oh, we're staying here a little too long. This is getting a little sketchy, but nothing really was setting off any alarm bells for me. You know, it's just kind of a run. This is just kind of the way we operated. <clears throat> but when Captain Bone blows by those stairs and goes back towards the fire, I, I was like, oh my God, we're in trouble. And I looked at the guy behind me, who was that guy from Engine One, and he, his eyes were big. And he's like, we got to go get him. And so I start chasing Captain Bowen down. And I'm just kind of like, he's moving fast. Like I'm like kind of jogging like, Hey cap cap. I'm getting low on air. I'm getting low on air cap. I got to get out of here. We got to go cap. We're getting low on air. And like, like two or three times, like you get to the point where I'm like putting my hand on his shoulder and he would kind of dart away and be like, come on, Jay, come on, let's go. Come on, come on. And he, um, he brought us all the way back to that alcove, you know, and, and I couldn't really, I was, I mean, looking at the map now, it makes me feel stupid. But at the time I was totally lost. Like I could not, I did not understand how we got back there. That new hallway we'd gone down was new to me. So it was just kind of disorienting. It was super smoky. That room that I told you about where we took the glass, it was rocking now. Like it was, the heat wasn't too big of a deal, but it was pushing a lot of smoke. And I haven't really so, talked about it. 
was there a fire? Was that where primarily where the fire was? And then at the end of the hallway too? All of those. So the room where it says origin of fire, all mm -hmm. the way down those rooms, every one of those rooms had fire in them. Okay. All right. So right to that. And that was the last one that we were in. That was the last room that had, had kerosene dumped on it. Like that was the, <clears throat> like whatever, for whatever reason, those four rooms were the, the object of yeah, the arsonist. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the other thing I forgot to mention is it was, uh, it was nine. I think it was like 95 degrees out that day. And this building was heated or was cooled to 68. That's what the whole building was kept at. So it was sucking the smoke in, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, so, yeah. so the high pressure hot air was pushing into the low pressure cool air. And instead of the smoke leaving out those vented windows, it was just coming into the building. And that's why the stairwell was charged all the way down. That's why like yeah. every floor was smoky. There's also some smoke damper issues that were caulked open, but mainly it was a reverse stack effect that filled that building with smoke. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we're right there in that alcove in the, um, I was, I was like face to face with Captain Bowen. And this is when it kind of dawns on me that he was not at full Captain Bowen um, quality or, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't up to his full self because he, he moved there and he was real aggressive and real, like kind of driven with, with the way he was moving. And then when he got there, like his, his posture dropped, like his shoulders slumped down a little bit and he kind of opened up his posture and he was kind of like looking around and like, he, and it seemed like he was like, something was missing. Like it just wasn't commute computing to him. And then that's when I, that told me something was wrong. Cause he was, you know, he was such a driven guy. And so I grabbed him by his straps and I was like, captain, we got to leave right now, man. Come on, let's go. We're leaving. And he kind of like leaned into me and which made me even more worried. Cause he was like, I was, I was his rookie, you know, and to talk to him like that and him just kind of be okay with it really showed me that, that something was wrong. The other guy who was with us had, was in that bathroom. You can see there's a little picture of a toilet there in that screen. He was like standing in that doorway. And he told me, he said he put his hand back and he felt he was in a bathroom. And then his first thought was like, my God, they're going to find us. I'm going to be dead in this little bathroom. And he felt like well, embarrassed by it for some reason. Mm. Anyway, <clears throat> we start moving around and I grab Captain Bowen and pulling him. And I yelled to that other guy. It's like, hey, keep him moving forward. I'm going to go find a way out. Because I was, I was lost. I was totally lost. I didn't want to just wander off into the smoke. I really, we were so low on air. I wanted to go straight back to the stairs, or at least make sure we moved Captain Bowen straight back to the stairs. And I made it right around the corner, again, to that doorway where it says recreation area, like right over to the left a little more, right there. That's where I was. I just made that corner just a couple feet. So I was in the recreation area room, or reception area room, sorry. <clears throat> and when I got there, I thought to myself, like, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna see these guys again. Like if I leave, if we separate right now, then I don't think I've got, I have no way of finding them. And so I turned around to go back. And when I turned around, like Ca Captain Bowen was right there. Like it was, it was startling to me because he was standing like face to face to me. I thought he was back where I'd left him and the other firefighter. And we, like, we kind of almost bumped into each other. And he's like, Jay, I got a buddy breathe, man. I'm out of air. I got a buddy breathe right now. And my, um, gosh, man, it was, it was, it's tragic. Like I, I, you hear this and it never really made sense to me until I felt it, but I felt my heart drop into my boot. Like I just felt my blood pressure drop. And because I knew I was like, well, dude, I'm out of air too. Like he, whatever he air he had in his tank, I knew I had about the same, but, but I just went for it, you know? And, um, I, uh, I reached back and he had trained me how to do this. Like, this is like, I, I he, he tra kept bone trained me up pretty good. You know, and I, I reached back and grabbed my buddy breathing hose. And we used to have the, like the Scott ran like a quarter turn. You, the buddy breathing valves were on like a quarter turn thing where you like stuck it on your hip and twisted it to lock it. Then you just turn it a quarter turn and it would come off. It wasn't like a pouch or anything. Right. And we used to run those in Asheville. I was on the left side and I grabbed it and I twisted my, pulled it, my hand slipped off and I tried again. My hand slipped off. And every time my hand would slip off, I would get like, like, Mad. Yeah. like yeah. stressed, you know, and it wasn't, it was, just, I was just, it was just so stressful that this high stakes operation kept on failing on me. And so the third time I went to do it and it slipped, I got so like kind of stressed out that I dropped down to my knees and I took both my gloves off and with naked hand, I could reach back and pull the buddy breathing hose off. And, uh, and, and I, I got it that time and Captain Bowen's left hip was facing me and he was calling his mayday. When I started doing this operation, I think I forgot to say it. I was like, call a mayday, Cap, call a mayday. And he starts calling his mayday while I'm doing what I just said. And um, I grab his buddy breathing hose, take it off his hip and make the connection. And I mean, it was like out of a movie or something, man, because um, when I made that connection, 
I heard his vibe alert go off and I saw the regulator, his regulator like pop up from his waist, like the air, it must've been facing his weight spotty because the air pressure pushed it up and it goes like, dunk. And then it just fell all the, all the air that was in my tank went out through his regulator. Right. Wow. wow. And so then I sucked rubber. I dropped down to my hands and knees, pulled my regulator. And this is so, it's so cliche, man, but this is the first time I've ever pulled my radio out in a fire. I pull my radio out of the pocket and I call like a pretty crappy mayday. I just like scream mayday a couple of times, basically stuck my radio back in my radio pouch or in my pocket. And uh, Captain Bowen hits the ground and he's like, Jay, set off your pass device, set off your pass device. And I reach up and I've pieced this together over the years, how this could have happened. But basically he sets off his pass device, you know, and I reach up and in my panic and in my rookie, this or whatever, I hit the reset button instead of hitting the pass device button, you know, cause you're just so used to it. You know, my hand goes up there, hits that block. I just hit the button. Right. Yeah. And so I just, I just hit that button, you know, and I heard Captain Bowen's pass device go off. So I had some feedback that I had done the right, right thing, but what had actually happened is I had not only silenced my pack, but I turned it off cause I already bled out all the air from Captain Bowen's regulator. Right. And so my pack is now silent. It's like off and bled down and everything. Captain Bowen's pass device is going off. And, um, and we just start crawling towards the center of the building. And we didn't like talk or make a plan or anything. We just start crawling away from the fire, you know, cause that so you fire- guys, you and Jay are pretty much yeah. just the two of you. Everybody else, everybody else had made their way. Cause everybody was out of air, right? Everybody, everybody was out of air. And but those guys, kept, some guys went ahead. They, they went ahead. And you, you're with Jay. Jeff, with I'm with Jeff. Jeff. Sorry, I'm with Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, I'm with Jeff. That's right. Yep. And so um, what happened with, uh, this is kind of a sidebar, and this is not necessarily my story to tell, but I'll just tell it anyway. What happened with that other firefighter that was with us is he was standing right in that alcove, right? And he, he, he it was just like this convergence of circumstances he was in that alcove when i made the corner and made the corner again and captain bowen followed me was just when uh yeah just when he, the guys from engine six had sprayed some water up and bounced it off the ceiling and it missed it him right so he looks down up that hallway or down that hallway however you want to put it towards where engine six is you can kind of see it on your map there and he, and for, and he all of a sudden realizes where he is. Like he's got orientation now. He's like, that's where engine six is. That's where the ladder is. That's the way we can get out. Right. He, it just dawns on him because he feels that mist. It all comes together. And so he turns, turns his head back and looks, looks down on these alcoves, looks right. And we're gone. We're just around the corner. And literally we're just around the corner in that reception area. And um, his vibe alert stops. So now he's got, 10 breaths left maybe mm. yeah whatever it is and um and so he's like he's like it's now's the time and he's like i'm gonna give myself 10 steps in that direction and see what i can find and he takes a few steps down down that hallway towards where engine six's nozzle man is he sees the guy on the nozzle and he he said he just started running jumps over the nozzle man follows their hose and those guys had breached a wall like they had come in through an adjacent built they came in through an adjacent office they had to breach a wall to get into the fire room and drag the hose through this breached wall he okay. jumps through the breached wall and then jumps out of the window onto the aerial as he's sucking rubber wow which was uh, which kind of throws a like this calamity into our mayday because okay, when, right. what, because we're good. calling a mayday while that's happening right so he gets on the aerial and everyone thinks, oh, those guys are calling the mayday for this guy because they lost him. And so uh, he's, he tells, he tells the, the captain who's in the aerial, tell Rescue 3 I'm safe to not look for me just to get out. Mm -hmm. Tell them that, tell the people that called the mayday that I'm safe. You know, he just wants everybody to know he's made it out because he thinks we're calling the mayday for him, which makes perfect sense. But, um, and so then when the chief on scene, the chief in command, he starts calling to see who called the mayday, who called the mayday. He's not getting anything back because Captain Bowen, who's calling that mayday, pulls the regulator when he sucks rubber, sucks in a bunch of smoke, and he's not able to talk anymore. He hits the ground, and now we're back to the part of the story where we just left off, where we're crawling towards the center of the building. So we make it to where um, that center of the building, kind of where it says elevators, you know, like we're, we're between the elevator. Yeah, that. <clears throat> we get there, and Captain Bowen stops, 
and he's kind of off to my right. I had disconnected our buddy breathing hoses and I, I hear him and I kind of see him out of the corner of my eye. He's, he's on his hands and knees talking on the radio, calling a good mayday. And I can hear it through my radio. And I was like, Cap, I'm going to go find a way out of here. And so I crawl off and it's, it's bad now, man. We're sucking all the smoke and I'm, it's not really fear as much as like this intense feeling of stress. You know what I mean? Like just like crushing. And I crawl off and I see those elevators and it was confusing to me because I hadn't seen the elevators before. And I was starting to get some kind of situational awareness about where I was, but because I saw the elevators, it was like a new landmark that I hadn't seen before. It made me think I was somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. And so I see those elevators and the smoke is like knee level, you know, it's like, like I'm low enough that if, as I'm like on, like on my face on the ground, I can see the elevator doors, but I can't see the buttons or anything. And I think to myself, like, should I hit the elevator buttons and like, see if the elevator comes. And I didn't want to go up into the smoke to find them. And I didn't, I didn't want to hit the button and then just sit there. Like I wasn't going to hit the button and just be like, I wonder if it's going to come. I wonder if it's in phase one mode. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. And so I was like, all right, bump this. And I crawled off and I came across um, some hose, you know? And I remembered um, the chief corpening was this guy that taught my rookie school. And I remember his creepy voice. He was a, he was a Marine. He like, he really, I loved the way he taught, but he taught me smooth bump, bump to the pump, you know, when I was that now I was in the fire service, that was a new thing to me. And I thought I could hear his voice and I thought of him, I was like, Oh my God, we're saved. And so I crawl along the hose, not very far, maybe like another 10 feet. And then I, um, I remember all that other hose. Remember that firefighter was flaking out and that uh, there's just hose everywhere. And none of it was really attached to anything. And this was all limp hose. And so I was just, again, I was like, I can't trust this hose. Meanwhile, um, Captain Bowen's mayday got interrupted when he, he, he like threw up in his mask. And so his mayday, his second mayday gets interrupted and command is like, you can imagine the radio traffic. It's just exploding at this point with confusion and who and what and where, and you know, who called the mayday rescue three. Did you call the mayday? Who is this? Where are you? And so I'm whipping my radio out and like, you, like for the second time ever talking on the radio, you know, it's like rescue three, we're on the fire floor. Help us hurry up. We're out of air. We don't have any air. I'm putting the radio back crawling along, picking it up, talking again. And I make it all the way around to where it says on your map there, it says R3 firefighter removes space piece, drops radio, which is an embarrassing thing to have written about me. But that is true. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. And this point, I was crawling away, looking for a way out. And I could see, I must have been getting just, just really worked over by the smoke. Cause I could see the window. Like I could see glass over to the right, like the opposite side of the building there. Like I can see sunlight coming through these like vinyl blinds and they're all kind of, they're kind of sagging from heat, you know? And it just, it cut into me. I was like, Oh my God, I'm, that's the last I'm going to see the sun. Like I really thought like, this is it for us, you know? And it was, it was uh, the, the situation was getting pretty bad. And I started to kind of fade out and, um, I was thinking about my family quite a bit. And the, the next thing that kind of takes, wakes me up again, basically, is I hear the chief on the radio say, hey, rescue three, go to the stairs, go to the stairs. And, and it bothered, and it bothered me. I don't know, I don't know why it, was, it just, it just felt like, and I, and I, I don't mean to, um, <clears throat> it was a great idea. I don't mean to take a shot at the chief here, but it like, it was insulting to me somewhere down deep of my, I was like, well, no crap, chief. That's, that's a great, that's exactly what I'm looking to do, man. But I need a little more than just go to the stairs. I need help. You know, I just, please come help me. And, um, and so I whipped out my radio and I, um, effectively resigned from the Asheville fire department over the radio. And can I, is this, is it a, do we curse on these podcasts? This you go ahead. Yes, absolutely. And so like, and I'm not proud of this, but this is exactly what happened. I whipped up a radio and I was like, come fucking get us. And then for some reason I spiked the radio because, and I think as I look back on, there's a lot of reasons, but I kept on having to stop and talk and put it away and stop and talk and put it away. I was like, I got work to do, man. I don't have time for these bullshit excuses. Or I just, I just, I just need to either come help me or leave me alone. You know, and they were trying hard to help us. There were so many people that were truly risking their lives to come help Captain Bowen and I, and I don't, I don't mean to shed to make light of that or imply it was anything but that. But at right. the time, there's, in the there's, moment, a, there's a there's a, a, a shit ton of guys outside who are right. doing everything they can to come get you. 
Right. So, yes. but, but I mean, no one, no one, none of those guys are in your position. Right. So, I mean, don't feel sorry. I, I, mean, I think that everybody that watches these things would be probably at the same point you are, right? Like go to the stairs. No shit, Sherlock. Yeah. Good idea. You know, that's what you, that's what you've been trying to do for the last. So, I mean, I get it. I think that you were at your, um, you were at your life's end. I was at my life. So um, whatever you had, say. I, yeah. 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 I got away with that one. No one, I never got in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, so I spiked my radio and, and as I said before, like I was, I was no longer going to be an Asheville firefighter. Like I was like, I'm, this is a dumb job. I'm not that into this anymore. And I end up ripping off my mask and my helmet all in one go. And there's some like, there's some pretty lame real reasons. Like I was like, Oh, my mask was getting foggy, but as I've researched it, you know, I found that tons of people in near death experiences, they ditch their gear. And what most, most psychologists and neuroscientists point to is that people are trying to get space from the stressor and the gear represents that stressor. Like people who are lost in the woods sometimes ditch their backpacks, mm -hmm. you know, or um, firefighters ditch stuff. I, I'm having trouble thinking of other examples, but there's a lot of examples, anecdotal examples out there of people doing that. And it's op the opinion, it's, you obviously can't get any real research on this, is that it's just to get some space between the stress, between the stimulus of, of the situation. So I ripped my helmet and mask off and I was like, it's me and it's me and Jeff against the world. Like it's, no one's coming was, was the feeling I had. And for whatever reason, I spun around and I was heading um, like north in that hallway where that final X is where it says face piece drops. But I turned around and I put my left shoulder on the wall and I started crawling down that hallway and I was just trying doors. I had took my ax with me. I was like, I'm not leaving this ax. And I was trying doors. And, you know, there's, you can see there's three doors down that east hallway. And I was, I really didn't have much hope of living, but I was not going to give up. And I was like, they're going to have to find me. I'm going to crawl to death or not. No one's going to find me giving up. And so I checked one door was locked, checked another door was locked, checked the third door is locked. And down, down below out of the map where you can't see there's like, it's like a terminal hallway. Like it's like, you know, you get that there's one door at the very end, like the flat of that hallway. And that's it. Like that door, that door is locked. That hallway is now over. And I was like, Oh my God, this, this is it. That was the last door but I just kept on going and kept my left hand search going. And I brought me back up to the South stairwell and I opened that door and it was, it was awesome, man. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was clear of smoke because it had, no one had used it the whole time. So it was clear and it was lit and it was cool. And it was, I mean, I cannot imagine a better, better thing to find. And I, uh, I threw my ax in the door to, to keep it open so I could find it spun around, crawled back to Captain Bowen as fast as I could. And he was still, um, he was still in the fight. Like he was, um, he, he was conscious. He hadn't moved, but he was doing everything he could do to, uh, to maintain his survivability. You know, he was, he was, he was fighting. And I, um, I, I grabbed his air pack strap and he, um, he kind of, he, he kind of mumbled my name. He was like, Jay, Jay, you know, like he said something, so he said my name and something else that I couldn't, was kind of intelligible. I just grabbed his straps and we started moving out and I drug him down that same East hallway, down to the South stairwell, down, down to the fourth floor. And then when I got to the fourth floor, um, I was feeling better. You know, I had got some air. I don't know. I don't know why I probably the air was probably the biggest thing. Captain, me and Captain Bone were essentially safe at that point. You know, we were breathing. And so I, Captain Bone was like, he had passed out. And so I rolled him over and I, um, I tried to find his radio. I looked in his radio pocket and his radio is gone also. Cause I was going to like call command or, you know, get back together with the Asheville fire department as it were, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sorry for drunk texting you chief, but I'm um, really, yeah, can, I'm, can I, you hire me back for a couple yeah. more <laughs> Can I keep my seniority number? <laughs> anyway, he didn't have his radio. He lost his too. And, um, so I was like, well, I guess we've come this far. And so I just kept on dragging him. I was dog tired, man. My legs were burning. I was just felt like crap. And we were moving out down the stairs and I got to the third floor and uh, I heard, and I, I really want to make a point of this. Like the, I heard someone call down from the fifth floor. I'm not trying to imply that I heard like the voice of some divine source or God or anything. I like, I thought someone was yelling to us from the fifth floor. 
And I yelled back and they were like, Hey, is anybody down there? Something along the lines. And I was like, yes, please help me, help me. And when I did that, man, it's, it's the craziest thing, but I went from rescuer to victim, you oh. know, and I was like kind of jacked up and like, you know, I can imagine a lot of cortisol and adrenaline's running through my body right now. I'm dragging Kevin Bowen. And, and when I heard those, that voice, and I believed that someone was going to come save us, my blood pressure dropped. I felt like I was going to pass out again. I had to catch the stairs and I just like was holding. I was like, Whoa, whoa, whoa okay. I got to hang in there, hang in there a minute. And I kind of like, like was like, I gotta, I gotta stay in this. I gotta stay in the fight. And I grabbed Captain Bowen, tried to move him and I couldn't move him. Like the strength that I had from all that other dragging was just gone. It was just like the switch. It was amazing how quickly that switch flipped yeah, yeah. from, you know, from rescuer to victim, but it, it was, it was full. It fully, fully did. And so then I, um, my plan was I, I grabbed him by his straps and my feet were a few steps lower on the stairs because he was on this landing and I jacked my feet up to the landing and my, I figured I could just fall backwards and like pull him down the stairs with me. And that would be like, or I'd be like a counterweight to get him moving. Yeah. And it, it kind of worked, but I, I ended up passing out at that point. And, uh, and Captain Paul Monroe, who was the guy, who was the officer that Captain Bone was talking to um, at the top of the stairs when his firefighter was playing out the high rise kit. Uh-huh. That captain, he brought his firefighter back in. This is on his third third round, and he uh, he heard the third and the, the fourth and the fifth floor being searched. He left his firefighter in the north stairwell, and he's like, "You you own the stairs. If those guys pop out, you get them." And he went to the third floor, and um, and he heard Captain Bowen's pass device, real quietly. And he he said it was really smoky even on the third floor, and he had to keep contact with the wall to kind of stay oriented. And he moved towards the pass device and he quieted down. And he could hear it again. And he'd move and he'd hear, stop, have to stop to listen. He could hear it. And he makes his way to the south stairwell. And then he sees um, me and Captain Bowen lying head down. Captain Bowen's on top of me lying. We're both head down the stairs. And he calls it in. And this is where you, you mentioned like all these people doing, fr like frantically trying to help us. Um, Josh Walton, who was the driver of squad one at the time, he was on the initial alarm he had grabbed this guy, Ross Parkinson, who was a one month rookie to the Asheville fire department. He had been online for one month. He was keeping his gear in his truck because we used to, you know, travel around all these stations. He heard about the fire. He lived in town and he just drove to the fire just to check it out, you know? And so when he pulls in is right when the mayday drops and Josh Walton's like, put your shit on. We got to go find these guys. And so this guy's first month on the job, he's climbing the aerial into that fire floor that, um, that that firefighter from engine one had jumped out of comes through that window, follows the engine sixes hose line to the nozzle clips a rope bag there and he starts searching the fifth floor for us. Mm. Um, Captain Radford with Paul, with um, Paul Walker, who is this firefighter on engine two, the, this is the first due company. They uh, also came in and were searching the fourth floor. Cap, uh, Paul carried extra air pack, one for me and one for Captain Bones. He's carrying three air packs. Is he looking for us? They hear Captain Monroe call in and he's found us and they kind of converge on us instantly. Captain Monroe kind of woke me up. And he said that this is the crazy thing. Captain Monroe, I don't remember this, but he told me I woke up, looked at him and said, we got to get out of here. And then rolled down the stairs. And as I was rolling down the stairs, he said my head was hitting the rail. Like, you know, the verticals on stair, like, it was like, ding, 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 ding. He said, just bounced off. All these. You're laughing. You can laugh about this, Jay. And it's a funny thing, man. With like, like, you can just imagine like a cartoon. You know, this guy rolling down the stairs, like, bing, 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 bing. He said, I hit every one with my head on the way down so i get I'm glad you can laugh about it i mean it's, it's just, that's that's a harrowing harrowing story and um i'm glad you are here to talk about it um i'm sorry that uh we lost uh captain bowen because it does sound like like he was a firefighter's firefighter and um would be um you know um leading Asheville fire department into yes. the future but uh and he but still is. He, he uh, still is. He fought. He fought for a long time that day. And, and I don't mean to laugh, man. I'm not laughing at the loss. Of I know. Bowen. I know. I'm, not, I'm not laughing at this tragedy, but no, it's fine. And I, I, I know you're not laughing at the tragedy. You're laughing at the, at the instance of your head hitting the thing, yeah. which is that's cartoonish. You know, it's cartoonish. That's cartoonish. But yeah. Um, yeah. And um, but I'm glad that you didn't quit the fire department that day. I'm glad that that you, that you continued on. Um, what a, what a, what a crazy story. Um, so uh, I guess uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is real. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Did they test you? Do you know what your levels were? You know, um, 
they did test me. I was higher than Captain Bowen. Really? Yeah. And I and I talked to the um, fire chief about that. I was like, why would why would I have? And I don't remember. I'm, I think it was like I was at like thir- a thirty two, and he was in like the twenties. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, how does, how does that work? How come I was so much higher than him? And I guess the, uh, the process of CPR flushed his blood. So by the time he went to the autopsy, there was less CO bonded to the hemoglobin. So that makes sense. I think that's the truth. That makes yeah. sense. And because I didn't, I didn't have CPR, they didn't, I didn't get quite as flushed and they tested me sooner. You know, so I did get flushed. Like I ended up getting flown to Augusta where there was a hyperbaric chamber and they, they did a lot of uh, high pressure oxygen to kind of push the poisons off me. And so um, that did get cleaned up, but they tested me sooner and I didn't have the CPR to flush me the way he did. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I think it does. Obviously uh, you spent time in a hospital. How long were you in? Not the long, hospital? not long. I, um, so yeah, they took me, to, this building was across the street from the ER, which is convenient, but mm. they took me to the ER and I like, I thought I was going to go home that day. Like, I was like, I'm fine. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm okay. Like just, I don't, I, and I told, I even told the doctor, I was like, I don't want to work. I'm not going to finish today's shift, but I think I'm okay. I definitely want the rest of the day off. Well, you quit. And, well, I had quit. Yeah. I was expecting to finish the day on my own terms. Yeah. And, and I thought I was fine until I saw this, this nurse um, lubing up an intubation tube. And then I was like, oh, my God, am I going to die? Are you about to do CPR on me? <laughs> and she's yeah, like, no, honey, but you're going to go to sleep. And that's the last thing I remember. And there, that, that time, the hospital was kind of crazy. But I went to sleep. I woke up the next day intubated. And um, that's when I found out Captain Bowen hadn't made it. It was the July 29th. And I, so, it, just, um, it looks like the report says that there was a total of nine firefighters who were hurt on this varying yeah. bumps and bruises and stuff. And, and obviously your smoke inhalation probably be yeah. the worst. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, so Captain Bowen obviously got the worst of it. Mine was the second, I guess mine was the second worst injury. There was a guy that had a, um, I don't, I don't know too much about his personal medical stuff, but I think he had a heart attack on scene. Oh yeah. Like he did not, a, not like a full blown widow maker, but I, I, I talked to him and I talked to the fire chief and he described the, and I don't, I don't know the terms well enough to, to articulate it, but he had something going on in his bloodstream that showed he had a heart attack during that time. You know, so he was out. Um, one guy threw out his back. Um, several people got hurt from heat exhaustion, just from work. You know, they worked the guys that were on their third bottle fighting this fire. Yeah. They obviously like kind of cranked into overdrive and worked a lot harder for the rest of the hot day. Yeah. yeah. And so that, that was about it. You know. So um, it looks like it was a four alarm fire, I guess. The, ultimately, it got knocked down from the outside and then um, or they made they transitioned from the outside to the inside off of the ladder. Right. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so I ended up using um, they use a ladder as like a flying standpipe, basically, yeah, to put yeah. the bulk of the fire down. Um, and I, honestly, man, like once once we were out of the building, I kind of, I don't really know what happened much more during that fire other than it just the a new chief came in the uh, chief Clark from, uh, from B shift. He uh, obviously by the time the mayday went out, there was a lot of people on scene, but a new fire chief came and took over and he pulled everybody out of the building and just did a hard reset and they went in and put it out, you know, and that that's did a great job of it. So, um, so obviously that was a bit, a big, a big event in uh, Asheville history. Um, lots, I'm sure, um, internal reports and, and research and studies yeah. on exactly what happened. Um, you guys, I know, put a lot of effort into training mm-hmm. after this. Yeah. Um, what was the big, was it uh, all Mayday? Was it all a lot of uh, other oh, operations yeah. too? Was it? It was, was all everything, man. I mean, it was like, the, I, I really applaud the fire chief. He didn't look at, he looked at this incident quite a bit and he also looked at the entire fire department. He's like, where else do we have weaknesses? What, what is going to kill my next firefighter and how am I going to avoid that? And so we've changed um, like our writ assignment is very different with a lot more training. Everyone's got a much higher level of firefighter uh, survival and RIT training. We have three companies in the city that are considered um, technician level RIT. And they're the ones that uh, one of those three companies will be RIT at every one of our fires. Um, and that, that are, that, um, 
that technician level training comes from the North Carolina Breathing Equipment School, which is where, uh, you know, Captain Harden's the boss of that school. Um, we ha had an extensive um, reboot in our command and control. You know, it used to be that, like, the fire, you show up on a fire, and it's really up to the captain to figure out what to do, and the chief would kind of stay outside and keep track of what those captains were doing. Now we have a really robust system of of assigning people and make people stay on the truck unless they get an assignment and they're they're known what their assignment is and what they're going to do. There's always someone on deck to back that person up. It's much much more refined, almost unrecognizable compared to what we used to do. We all carry radio straps now. It's a it's part of our policy. That everyone keeps a radio and a radio strap with a little pell mic, so we can't lose our radios. No one can quit and spike their radio or, you know, that's been pretty effective. I accidentally on that fire, I accidentally changed fire channels. Like, well, I was in my few communications, I had gone from fire two to fire three on accident. And so that's, that's been averted. Um, what else have we done? We've done a lot more. Um, oh, staffing is a big deal with us now. We don't, we don't run below our minimum staffing ever. We put trucks out of service before we'll run them with less people than are, are at the minimum. Well, we've done some forced hire backs, you know, and so that's, that's been a big deal. Um, we've done a bunch of, um we've, we've done a lot of work on high rise and um like kind of commercial fire fire attack which been pretty good for us um in the wake of the fire i had a hard time figuring out how to um how to deal with stressful situations and so i've had a long time i've had a long time meditation practice and i felt like that was a big contributor to my survival and a big yeah. contributor to how i kind of recovered from the fire, you know, cause it was, I felt horrible, man, for years, you know, like, like I would have to check in with myself multiple times a day. Just like, are you, are we okay? Am I, am I nuts right now? Or am I okay? Am I doing, you know I mean? Like, and if I feel like if you have to ask yourself multiple times a day, if you're okay, you're probably not okay. You know, but and, I, I don't do that. So I, but I haven't <laughs> been through um, your stressful, stressful situation. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was so, so anyway, like, we started this, um, this, this program that teaches firefighters different mindfulness practices that'll help hopefully help them deal with stress and kind of have a place for the stress to go ahead of time rather than just dealing with it after the fact. And then also hopefully that makes firefighters have access more functional memory when they do get really stressed out so they can make better decisions based on their training. You know, that's a program we've been doing for about seven years now and it's been pretty effective for us. Um, that's good. I read a book on, uh, on first responder mindfulness. And what was it? What was the book? Um, I, I have, I have to find it somewhere, but, uh, okay. a, I think he was a cop maybe. Okay. And, um, it was really good. It was, you know, it was, a it, it was short. It was, uh, mm -hmm. but it was very good. It had some good stories and, uh, related, I'll find the thing. And it's mm -hmm. probably something that, that, uh, you're a part of that. Um, it, it, that's, that's a different Avenue, right? Uh, we don't yeah. really think about it. It's again, um, everybody's uh, wants to be a tough guy and that might be a more touchy feely, but it's more, it's, it's you, right? It's, yeah. It's finding out about you and what drives you right. and what, how to re, how, how you would, how you address the stress and that kind of stuff. Right. But that, that's good. Good stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's funny. Like I used to, um, I used to teach a lot at the Academy, you know, truck operations, forcible entry, ventilation, firefighter survival, rescue. And now the mo the majority of what I do out there is teaching firefighters how to meditate. And it makes me kind of feel like a nerd sometimes, yeah, yeah. but it doesn't matter what, a firefighter knows if they're too stressed out to access that information, I mean, you might as well have a civilian in there, you know, so teaching firefighters how to use their brain effectively, like the buddy breathing thing, you know, like if I had thought, or if I had been able to shred the stress a little bit and said to Captain Bowen, no cap, I don't have any air either. Let's just get out of here. Yeah. We might've made it to those stairs together, but I applied the tool before the brain and it didn't work out. You know, that book was the mindful responder. The mindful responder. I'm gonna yeah, yeah. write that. Hang on, so I'm gonna write that. You, uh, yeah, I can send you the, the stuff. First responders field guide to oh, improve nice. resilience, fulfillment, presence, and fitness. Oh, uh, nice. It was good. It's a it's a good book. So let's talk about. Um, um, I want to give. Can you give uh, our listeners, our watchers, maybe two or three things um, that you want them to take away? I mean, there's so much in that. There's so there's much so in much. that, and I, I guess. I guess, you know, limiting you to two or three um, is tough, but two or three things maybe that they could take from today um, that they could apply, that they could, they could think of. I mean, I think that they should all look into maybe the, the mindfulness stuff, but that's mm -hmm. another podcast. That's another podcast. Um, 
but two or three things maybe that that they could take away from today that you think really um, you know in, would impact their their surviving the fire service. Okay, well, from order, I'd say the most important thing I hope every firefighter takes away and every fire chief is to use your air like your life depends on it. You know, using, um, if, if everything had been the same in that fire and we had had a practice in Asheville of using our, our bottled air, the operations section for entering, fighting fire and leaving and save that emergency air for emergencies only, not for exiting, not for pushing it a little further, not for spraying a little more water, Captain Bowen would be alive today. If when he, when he, when we got lost or when he started showing, he had some signs that something was wrong with him and we didn't, and we still had all of our emergency air in our bottles, we, we would have just walked out of the building, right? We could have, we would have had the air to find our way home, but because we used our emergency air for operations, when we had an emergency, we had no recourse. And it was really just a matter of time before we killed somebody, you know, it's just the statistics were eventually going to catch up with us. So that I, I hope that everyone takes that message back to their fire department, and to their fire truck. Um, the next thing, and I touched on this a little bit, is that buddy breathing hose. Like Before you go to your second, before you go to the next okay. one, there's a video out there that I think everybody should see. It's Brunacini mm -hmm. talking about just about that. If a firefighter, if every firefighter knew that their, their life is, is, is in that bottle, right? Right. Right. If they knew that they had six breaths left before they, they would die, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, we have to look at it differently. You're absolutely yeah. right. We just... I retired from DC, but we just went to from 60 minute to 45 minute cylinders. Wow. A 45 minute cylinder is a, is, is a, a game changer for us as far as size. Yeah. But oh, it's yeah. also a game changer because we went from 60 to 45 right. with a 60 minute cylinder. Our SCBA management style was don't run out. Yeah. Right. You had 60 minutes now with 45 minutes and with the, with the, with the low air alarm going off early. Yeah, and apparently there's some kind of reverse air uh, science going on that they, they found air law that you're not really getting everything out of it. Right, like the bigger the bottle gets, the less you get out of that. Full yeah, yeah, something with with air the law. pressures. Right, yeah, something with the air law. They're not getting everything out of it, and and now it's almost like holy crap, what did we do? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, air, the air, our air is so important, and it really right. is a, um, a life changer. So God, I'm sorry, guys, you're you're. No, it's great. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's funny how like Brunacini's video, like it almost sounds abstract, but it's not. That's a literal interpretation of what's going on in your air pack. We treat it like it's just kind of arbitrary. Anyway, um, the buddy breathing hose, you know, Captain Bowen's like, Jay, I need to buddy breathe. And my first reaction was, yes, sir. And I went for it. You know, I applied the tool before I applied the brain. And if I had thought first and just and made it, you know, just taken one second to be like, is this a good idea? I think Captain Bowen's alive today in that circumstance, you know. But I just, I, I quickly went for the smash instead of the thinking and, and applied the tool. You know, those buddy breathing hoses are not magic wands. You know, you can't hook up two empty air packs and make one full one. Um, and that's something that hadn't really occurred to me until then. You know, I just thought, I'd always thought, well, if somebody gets low in air, you say, I need a buddy breathe and somebody else will hook you up and then you'll be that. Well, if you walked into a fire together, you breathe your air together, you can't hook up together because you're both out of air. And that's seemed, a good point, right? Is because... Because your buddy breathing, if yours is already empty, yeah, you're not going to get much more out of it. Yeah, I mean, if you're heading out and somebody's heading in, sure, maybe that, but not the guy you walked in there with. I mean, unless there's a gross discrepancy in fitness. Um, and then the final thing that I'll leave you with is um, that person, that voice I heard calling down from the fifth floor was not there. there I've talked to everybody on scene that day. No one actually did that. And I've also done a lot of research about auditory and visual, visual hallucinations in these high stress situations. And that's a real thing. Like there's auditory exclusion, auditory inclusion, where you have hallucinations. And that was one of those things. But because I heard that voice, I believed that voice was there. I went from being a rescuer to being a victim. And it had not been for Captain Monroe there would be a double line of duty death. You know, there was not, I talked to my doctors at the time, like there wasn't a lot of time to spare. I wasn't going to just recover in that stairwell. And so I guess the, the thing I like to leave everybody with is like, you got your responsibility to survive and to have your company survive is your business. Like, don't, don't anticipate someone's coming. No one's going to do it for you. Like no one's coming to help you make it all the way out all by yourself every time. And if you go in with that attitude, you'll probably make it out with that attitude.
that was good. Great stuff. Great stuff. <laughs> I really, um, I really appreciate um, everything you've done today and, and really uh, uh, bearing, bearing everything. Um, I, I, it sounds like, um, you know, you've come to good with, you've gotten over your, your second guessing, your, your questioning yourself, uh, that kind of thing. And um, I hope you do well on your lieutenant's test that you took Thanks, today man. and that you um, become the leader of uh, and can pass this stuff on to a new generation of Asheville firefighters. I yeah. hope the, the listeners, you know, get something out of what you gave them because uh, it's coming from a different place than a lot of other people. There's fortunately, unfortunately, there's 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 um, it's tough for us to, to get to the brink of death that you did mm-hmm. and be able to to talk about it. So um, thank you for, for doing that. One, one other thing real quick. Um, I want to share the screen again, because um, the, there's a video here um, you can find online that tells a little bit about the, the story that we talked about. Um, uh, the link is going to be included in the Mayday Monday uh, posting uh, with fire engineering. Um, But you get a taste of uh, those who watch the video. Again, it's only a seven minutes long. Please log on the link. Like I said, the link's there. You're going to hear some of this radio traffic. You'll get to hear more about um, about Jay talking, and uh, you'll get a, a a video that you can take with you to to learn about the fire, and you can share this with your firefighters. So that's the video. Please take a look at that. Let me stop sharing. And um, take it, take take your opportunity to learn about this fire. There's a lot going on here. Um, in addition to the the mayday and uh, the survival story, um, you can. There's the issues with uh, the the buildings standpipe mm-hmm. systems. There's issue with um, kinking hoses and things like that. So lots of stuff for here that for us to learn from. Not just the uh, the the firefighter survival part. Other things you can learn from as well. With that in mind. Uh, this month's this month's Mayday Monday survival skill. Let me share the screen again. This month's Mayday Monday survival skill is going to be uh, kind of performing your own your own size up. Uh, Jay touched about this, and he'll talk about it in a second. But if you think about most of our buildings we go to, if the fire is on the fifth floor, if we go to the fifth to the fourth floor, the floor, floor below, and walk around it in in uh, not in smoky conditions, we get a layout of the floor we're going to go to. So when you get to the fifth floor and you put your mask on and it's zero visibility, if you can, if you're able to count the doors, you may be able to find your fire room. There's always going to be that scenario though, that, that it doesn't fit this thing. And that's what the, the building these guys faced in uh, Asheville, which we talked about earlier, how there was a uh, unpermitted change on the fire floor that, that threw them off of this very thing. But, but if you can get out, go find a fire department friendly building, one that will let you, let you, you know, go up and down the hallways um, and, and go up, tell, tell your crew, we have a fire on the fifth floor, have them go to the fourth floor and, you know, and, and say it's in room 511. All right. So you go to the fourth floor, you find 411, you say, okay, it's five, it's five doors down from the stairwell. Now, when you go to the fifth floor stairwell and you go to the, to zero visibility. If you can count down, hopefully you can find that. Uh, but it's a good way to kind of practice that, get some situ- situational awareness because we can use this in some of our fires. And um, you've, we've seen some other uh, close calls, line of duty deaths where this may, may play a factor. There's a picture here also of, uh, we, I had some inserts. There's a company out there that sells these things you can throw in there, or you can use wax paper. You can always do the, um, you know, turn your mask inside or your hood inside out. I think that's like the JV way to do it. You can find other ways. Press and seal works great. Just be careful. Don't put the press and seal on too long. Sometimes it leaves the film. Mm-hmm. There are some commercially made inserts if you want to go do that. Or you can use wax paper or um, other things to put inside there. You can also put a bag over their head. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and maybe that would be a, a time thing, right? If you can get it done before you put it here. But anyways, um, those are some options. So uh, look at that. That's going to be coming out first, the first m- Monday of the month. You'll get that. There'll also be a link in here to the podcast. Please look at that. Share this with your friends and family. I had a picture sent to me earlier from guys that where I used to work. They're watching last month's podcast. 
Uh, we're getting really good reviews, um, and we should because we get guys like Jay who come on here and tell us their story. Jay, thank, thanks a lot. It was um, it's a crazy thing. Um, hopefully, it's a it's one time, yeah. one time in your career. Um, and I'm glad that you didn't quit the fire department. Again, uh, good luck for your test. Um, appreciate you coming on. And that's our Mayday Monday for July 2021. Remember again on uh, July uh, this month is uh, the, the 245th birthday of our country. And also we want to remember uh, Jeff Bowen from the Asheville Fire Department. Thank you. Thanks, and we'll Tony. see you in, in August.